Hey folks, I'm Gene Delasala, president of Audioholics, and we have another special video from our friends at Legacy. We have Bill Dudleson from Legacy Audio, and we're going to be talking about this new speaker here. It's called the Valor. Am I saying that correctly? Yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, tell me why you named it the Valor mm -hmm. and why you have a speaker like this. Um, you know, basically the the name uh, was we wanted something short and uh, simple and kind of um, something that was sounded bold and strong and uh, and had a lot of sonic integrity to it so I thought Valor would probably be a decent name for it. Okay so is this your flagship model now? This it is. above the Whisper and the V. It is yeah it's our flagship that's right. Okay so what differentiates this product from all the other flagship products you've done in the past? Um, what I wanted to do each time I've done a speaker of this nature over the years I the last big step I made was with the, the Helix system in 2000 where um, I don't call it a product, I call it a research product and development, uh, constant development. And uh, the, the Helix system we worked on from until about 2012, from 2000 to 2012. Mm -hmm. And it had multiple revisions to the processor that was available with it. Uh, include, include, it had improved amplifiers over the years. Um, this system will be the same way. Um, and um, the purpose of the speaker, above all else, is the research to, to, to continue on in my wave launch reconstruction. Sound field synthesis is a big term right now in, in the AES papers and uh, people and, uh, are now getting excited about simulating a sound field. Part of it is the gaming stuff that you have going on with headphones and speakers and stuff. But the reality of it is this is something I've been doing since the 80s. And so what I'm looking to do is reconstruct the sound field of an event in your living room, which is a lot different than trying to, um, uh, you know, just basically eliminate, you know, I guess what I should say is I'm trying to eliminate your room as imprinting over the top of it. And that's the tough part about it. So you're basically doing an ambient reconstruction using just two speakers, but doing some tricks with DSP by having some drivers on the sides. That's exactly and right. And you guys call it Stereo Unfold? Stereo Unfold technology, yeah. Okay. Well, before we get into all this cool tech, I'm more of a nuts and bolts guy. I want to know what's behind the driver topology, what you guys have done here, because it's it's rather unique when I look at the speaker and I see all these large drivers and I notice they don't have big surrounds. Obviously, these don't have high excursions, so these aren't playing bass, am I correct? That's right. Yeah. So what are they playing? Why do you have three big drivers here? Yeah, it's interesting. They actually have about uh, one inch X max damage, they call it, where you could actually travel an inch before hitting. But you can see from this clearance, we're not using it that way at all. Right. Um, the speaker will handle a thousand watts per element what we're looking for is one thing only, and that is speed and radiating piston area. Um, we're looking for a total volume velocity and cubic volume from these loudspeakers. If you listen to the diaphragm when I touch it, you can hear it's a real high frequency sound compared mm -hmm. to say when I tap a woofer down here. And um, so it, it is a very uh, thin, stiff diaphragm that transmits sound across it very, very quickly. And uh, there's no, uh, you also notice there's an accordion uh, roll to it so right. it's not a, a rubber wrench this is going to uh, uh, be re excited and stimulate back to the, through the cone again. So is this a paper material? It's, it sounds like it's It paper. is a carbon pulp, yeah. It, Why it, go with that instead of like an aluminum or a beryllium or something like that? You know really uh, paper has you can do so much with with paper. You know, there's all kinds of papers. You usually think about all the different types of pulps and papers you can press, but it's a composite. And what's nice about it is is that you can make a soup of fibers of just the right length that you're looking for, mm -hmm. mix carbon into it, and then reconstitute it and vacuum form it to a thickness. And um, uh, these drivers in particular are from Italy, and they're very um, very well constructed, very precisely constructed. Right. So why do we have three again? So we basically have three drivers playing in the mids, mid-range yeah. frequencies. Yeah, we're trying to accumulate as much um, speed as we can in the system and accumulate as much volume velocity forward. The three drivers themselves mutually couple with each other and they provide better steering, better mm -hmm. vertical control. Um, that way we don't have lobing error. It is symmetric. Uh, relative to the in, into the forward direction here, and um, but more importantly, it's the stopping and starting, uh, and being able to reproduce the sound of the a human diaphragm, 
um, in a, a, a large instrument, whether it's a, a, the skin of a drum or a, or a, or a tuba. Or, or yeah, brass instruments. Brass in, instruments, especially, yeah. 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 I notice, guys, we always talk about this, uh, when you're dealing with large caliber speakers like this, these big towers, so many companies come out with these towers with lots of woofers, so they give you lots of cone area for the bass, and then you're stuck with a five and a quarter inch mid and a one inch tweeter. And you know, five and a quarter inch mids are not only limited in terms of sensitivity, mm -hmm. but in terms of output, and just you know how you control your directivity and everything else. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you look at the distortion curves, and when you look at tweeters, they're typically, if, if a tweeter is going to be used from 3K on up, it usually has terrible distortion around 1K. Right. And uh, so when you use multiple tweeters, um, th if you can get them to work together in synchronization, uh, you can do a lot of things better. What's unusual about this system is if you look closely into the center driver, this mid-range actually has a coaxial um, driver that's loaded into a uh, carefully machined throat. And you can see it from the sides here. It's actually got a nice taper to it. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you look at these two drivers here are AMT ribbons. They're four inches in length. And that by nature creates a very desirable beaming characteristic. Um, the, the drivers are operating on axis with each other. Um, and when they're, they're basically impeding each other, causing uh, increased radiation uh, energy, and therefore they're acoustically coupling, the uh, frequency response um, is going to be smooth, but at the same time it's not going to trail off at lower frequencies. Normally if you take a tweeter, it doesn't have any acoustic load at, at uh, the bottom end of its spectrum. This system helps load each other as the frequency drops. So you're increasing sensitivity by having by having two of them. You're increasing output capability, lowering distortion, and the way this is uh, configured, you're actually creating a better directivity. That's correct? right. Yeah. And for example, if I look where I'm standing, I'm looking right into this tweeter. This tweeter is tracking this direction. Right. This tweeter is tracking that direction. And normally, a loudspeaker, if you look at the polar pattern at, at, or a, or uh, the, the dispersion characteristics of a loudspeaker system, you usually see that the tweeter is beaming real hard straight ahead and then dies very quickly off axis. This system doesn't work that way at all. It, it follows quite far down the line. Now as I move this way with the loudspeaker, mm -hmm. it's turning itself down very quickly, which is just as desirable. Right, and that's uh, a function of this tweeter array, but also what you're doing in, right. the, in the speaker itself. Exactly. Uh, before we, again, before we get into that, because there's so much cool stuff to talk about the speaker, let's talk about bass. Mm -hmm. What are you doing for bass? You have, it can't just be this one driver that I'm seeing here for the bass. You're right. Yeah, there's another low frequency driver on the bottom. Um, those are uh, pretty weighty uh, drivers. They have uh, uh, 30 pound motor structures on them, and there's two 12 inch drivers, one here and then one on the bottom, one on the front bottom. and. Uh, uh, they're well coupled between that and the lower boundary. But on the back side, there are uh, two long throw passive radiators that have mm -hmm. two inches of, of uh, good travel in each direction. So yeah, it's a four inch peak to peak travel. So. so this is a pretty complex system in terms of how it radiates its base. It's not just radiating it, radiating it from a single point from one woofer, it's doing it from actual multiple points around the cabinet. That's right. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about how that plays into a room differently than a conventional loudspeaker? Yeah, you know, uh, the thing about this speaker that has uh, such an advantage is it's using DSP. So we're going to be able to um, it, it, I've always said that ultra low frequencies in a room, you know, when you get below 40 hertz, it's sort of like you might want to take a shower, but you're going to take a bath. In other words, the whole tub's got to fill up before you right. feel base. And that's kind of the way things are. Your boundaries provide the impedance that lets that woofer operate and gain up. Uh, the key is, is to synchronize that gain constructively in the direction that you want it to go in and not build up energy in stray fields and create standing waves. Okay, so basically guys, you're doing a sort of correction in the speaker itself before you get even into the DSP, just in the way that the speaker is playing into the room. And then once you get the speaker as linear as you can in the analog domain, you mm -hmm. should say, yep. that's when the magic takes right. over with the wavelet processor. That's right, in this case, we're trying to get to that first boundary as soon as possible. And being right at the floor, we're, we're, we're achieving that pretty quickly. Okay, so what, before we get in, again into the, um, the DSP function, what's the minus 3 dB point in terms of bass? 
what's the max output the speaker does cleanly mm -hmm. in a room and just give us some of the specs on that. Yeah, we get a, a, a really nice 18 hertz out of this system and it'll sweep from DC on up and not sound nasty. Uh, uh, you know, we, we do that when we test the, the room measurement. And uh, so it doesn't have too much trouble uh, covering the low frequencies. And I think um, by the time you have these four 12s working together as a pair, uh, along with the room's radiation loading, you're getting plenty of low frequency output. But I think where most speakers kind of fall apart is, is in that transition zone where that woofer stops and then the, the lower mid-range uh, has to be picked up. Yeah. So. It's interesting that you talk about that because we see so many times on the forums or just in general, guys get these little bookshelf speakers with a single mid and a tweeter and then they put like eight subwoofers in their room not realizing that the dynamic range of that system is not limited by the bass that they have because they have way more bass in the room. It's the actual small speaker that doesn't have enough mid-range or mid-bass output yeah. to keep up with the drivers from the subs. Yeah. So in this case, you're kind of matching. You're getting the massive output at low frequencies, but you're also getting at the, the mid-bass and the mid-range as well. Exactly, yeah. Baritone notes are this long in wavelength, and it's nice to to have a good amount of piston area to do that on the flagship speaker. So. Right. So let's talk about what Wavelet does, how many amplifier channels there are, what's going on on this side of the speaker, that side of the speaker, and up here. Because I, okay. see, I see grill covers here, so there's got to be something going something on Something going on back yeah. there, that's right. Yeah, the, the, the first goal with the Wavelet processor, beside it, beside it being a pre-amplifier, a DAC, um, and a control pre-amplifier in general, um, is that you have uh, crossover capability, full DSP crossover capability, and you also have a number of other uh, powerful tools in there. It's kind of an engineer's toolkit, you might say. Um, but we have the ability to uh, correct things in time, um, uh, to make a measurement of arrival or energy being released from the loudspeaker, and then how the room is coming back at it. And then from that, we can then apply a room correction that cleans up the early reflections. But um, when, after that's done, then we have the ability to actually retrieve ambient information that has been masked prior to this in the loudspeaker room playback. Uh, without step one, there's no point in going to step two. But step two is now to uh, uh, restore the ambient field as it would be at the venue. Our goal being to take you to the venue, not put the band in your room. We're trying to get you transported to the venue. And so we want the venue's characteristics, that, that those hall characteristics to be what you're hearing. So, so before you get into the stereo unfold, which is step two, let's go back to step one for a minute and, and make some clear, clarity on the room correction. When you do a room correction in a speaker like this, you're limiting that room correction. You're not going all the way to 20 kilohertz. You're stopping at the room transition frequency, which is what, around four or 500 hertz? Yeah, it's almost an exponential thing. Uh, you look at, at low frequencies where the boundaries are totally dominant to what the energy is, is arriving at the ear. And then uh, by the time you've rolled up to 100 hertz, um, your, your room variations are, are going to be reduced greatly. You may see some ripple and dip and stuff between two and 300 hertz due to floor reflections in mid-range regions. But typically the room is pretty much out of the way uh, up to a, at about 500 hertz. Now when we make our sweeps, we take 500 millisecond sweeps, but we only correct the first four, 40 milliseconds while we're we're analyzing the information out 500 milliseconds. It's only being corrected over the first 40 milliseconds. That's a lot of data that you're collecting. That's a lot of data. Yeah. Yeah, yeah a lot of data. Um, and, uh, you know, it, in terms of uh, trying to get the composite signal to arrive, we want the original launch that the performers had direct to the listener. And we also want the sound that was coming off the walls and everywhere else in the, in the hall to make it to the listener also, but we want it synchronized in time. Okay, so how does, tell me how Stereo Unfold works, what kind of drivers do you have on each side of the cabinet, and what kind of bandwidth are they playing? Sure. Um, uh, the ambient information itself is from about 80 hertz on up to about 7 kilohertz, um, and then the uh, information is, is steered. This is not just a, uh, an arbitrary 
uh, let's radiate it in all directions. You can see an upward tilt here to get the back wall and try to put the ceiling into play. And you can see that there's, um, if you look at the pictures online, you can actually see these drivers on the sides of the cabinet that have the ability to control radiation out to the sides. And what we're trying to do absolutely is make sure none of that arrives directly to the air. The speakers are oriented to be beamy. I used a large diaphragm, so they can't reach out and reach you directly. They have to come off of a surface first. And uh, you're kind of looking at the, uh, the prince of directivity now preaching late reflections. Well, I always wanted late reflections, but they have to be late. They can't be early reflections. So our goal with directivity control is to make sure that you are uh, in, in total perspective as to the first arrival and the later arrivals, so you can put the total picture together. And as a result, as, as uh, Gene had a chance to listen, I'll let him later talk about what he heard and what he thought he heard, but I, I can tell you that your sound field cues are remarkably improved. Right. Well, I will get into the listening test in a minute, but what I wanted to ask you is, if you're doing all this ambience reconstruction, um, what does that, how, first of all, how do, you, how do you tailor the sound per room um, when the installer comes and brings it into a room, do they make measurements at the listening position? Do they make it at the near field of the speaker? What exactly goes on in determining how to tailor this sound? Because everybody has a different room. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, what we're doing, first of all, is we're making the, the long-term measurement, those two sweeps that we make on each loudspeaker system. It's made about four feet out from the loudspeaker. Um, it's on the path from the center of the tweeter to the listener's ear on that line. And uh, at that point, the data is, is imported um, from each loudspeaker, and then it's uh, uploaded to a server. The computations are done uh, through linear regression or least squares analysis, basically, to minimize the error to the curve fit to get your room as, as time correct as possible. What we don't do is a bunch of frequency bending with a bunch of EQs jacking up and down. We're taking those reflections, the impact they have on the coloration, restoring them back in the proper place and time, and as a result, the ripples and the response are dropping out. And uh, so it's a lot different in the way they're doing it. But it's, it is a pretty simple measurement process. You're measuring two loudspeakers uh, from four feet away. So you upload this data to the server. Do you have someone in the back with a pencil and a, and a little slide rule doing the calculations? Yeah, and use, more or less, yeah. <laughs> or use yeah. something like MATLAB yeah. or something more sophisticated. Swedish. Yes. Um, no, actually, yeah. The, the, uh, there is a, a server dedicated for just this, and we accumulate the data. It's a research project, so by, by buying a set of these things, you're agreeing to be part of our research program nice. because we're going to take and, and analyze your data and do everything we can to build the best speaker we can and continue to improve that speaker. And uh, I look for that project to go on for a decade. Well, let me ask you this now. I understand the measurement process, the uploading to the server to do the calculations to come up with the, the best match for the speaker in the room. What about the room itself? Um, if you start throwing a bunch of bass traps and a bunch of absorption on the sidewalls and the ceilings, aren't you defeating the purpose of a speaker like this? Yeah, you know, first of all, you know, those things do not cure standing waves. Right. What I can tell you is you can change the cubic volume of your room and you can change the, its tonality to a certain degree. You can make different frequencies home at different points in the room by changing, by dis just sheer volume displacement. But just putting uh, uh, absorbers around your room, it's going to change the spectral content of the music. Now, if your speaker is an omnidirectional radiator, then I guess good luck to you and maybe you might be able to do something there. But with a, a loudspeaker with the directivity control, we're only trying to cover 60 degrees because you, the listening angles uh, back to the listener is, is never more than 60 degrees. And uh, uh, so, you know, it, it, you, you're basically better to have a room that is more normal. Uh, you typically have a carpet or a rug on the floor for comfort, and, uh, um, and you want your walls to have some live characteristic. Otherwise, your room's going to sound kind of anechoic, which we don't want. Very dead and dry. It's, you know, you don't want to sound like a telephone booth or sound like the inside of your interior of your car. Right. So. Or like you're in a NASA lab or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, when I looked at this room, it, it looked like a regular room that you would have in your house. I mean, everything here, you just have like wood walls, you have a couch, you have absorption through natural 
uh, things like throw rugs and stuff. So it's a very comfortable room, a very normal room to be in. And when I sat, it didn't matter whether I sat in the sweet spot or I sat on the couch to the left or to the right. I felt like I had incredibly good imaging with these speakers. In fact, initially I didn't even know you had all this processing turned on and you put on a recording and I'm like, there's a lot of ambience in this, in this recording. It sounds like, it almost sounds like when you get a really good multi-channel recording, let's say like Diana Krall, where they use the surround speakers to add ambience to the recording rather than gimmickry by throwing a guitar in the back and a cymbal on the, up above you or whatever. You guys have figured out a way to basically reconstruct a signal from two speakers to make it sound like you're listening to a good multi-channel system, literally with just these two speakers. Mm. But it sounds that in a way that's very natural because when you turned it off, even though the stereo, the signal was still in stereo, to me it sounded almost like it was mono at that point. Yeah. Like I felt like I was really missing something once you turn that off like my brain wasn't comprehending what was going on in the sound placement of the of the instruments and everything yeah you you were by nature uh already trained and qualified in in natural sound so you know what it should sound like and the closer we get to uh what i'll call natural reproduction or something close to perfection the, every time you make a step in that direction we immediately acclimate and so it doesn't take they take any time to like it. it's like hd tv who doesn't like it but at the same time, when you take it away, all of a sudden, you hear the flaws that you had to live with before. What I notice myself in the system is that it, the vertical squashing also is strange. Um, when uh, you take away the reconstruction, everything gets much smaller this way, and everything seems to be on a two-dimensional line compared to the three-dimensional field that you have when the reconstruction is, is being obtained. But yeah, that's to be expected. Stereo is indeed a trick. It, there is nothing theoretically correct about stereo. It's a summation of left and right channels. It creates a magic mono. And the fact that it does that is why it's still in existence. Mm -hmm. It generates a third phantom channel and uh, well, there's no speaker. So that's part of it's pretty cool. Right. Well, let me ask you, how easy is it once, once the system is set up, what kind of interface does the customer have to be able to control the parameters like turning off the stereo reconstruction or to turn off the DSP? Um, how do you control all this? Well, first of all, we like to show off what we're doing. So on the, uh, the remote app that comes with this, you're able to do all those things. You can, uh, you can defeat the room correction. You can defeat the um, stereo unfold topology. You can even defeat the appetizing filter that's in there um, for the DAC. And uh, plus you have volume control. Um, we know also too, if you sit down to listen to a, a classic rock album and you're gonna be listening to an album for an hour uh, and it's bass shy or thin uh, in the recording, that it's no sin to be able to wanna to correct that and still and get good sound, still using minimum phase filters that don't create a boomy characteristic. So with the room correction, you can throw some bass boost in there on the, on the contours and it, it works. It, 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 it it's kind of uh, salvages some of these classic recordings that, that don't necessarily have great uh, fidelity in their, in their range. Now what if, uh, for example, if you want to translate this to a multi-channel system, are you going to have like a, a, I guess, a theater mode that maybe would turn off the side channels if it becomes too much ambience with the additional speakers in the room? Uh, yeah, we have a theater mode right now that you can switch to that will automatically set the, the wavelet so you can feed an, uh, an input directly in from your processor. Um, I often get the question, geez, I already have a home theater processor. What do I do? Well, I've got, now I've got a wavelet preamplifier. Well, you run your analog main outs directly into the unit and uh, you simply set your uh, wavelet mode to uh, the, the theater home theater, which is a bypass mode. And so now you're using your volume control from your your normal preamplifier or your normal processor mm -hmm. for your home theater. Okay, that makes sense. So tell me, what does the system cost? What is it? What when you buy the system, what do you get with it, and what's the yeah. price? Sure, this is our flagship, and it's going to be a lot more expensive than than our other products. Um, this is a work in progress. Uh, list price on it's eighty thousand dollars. It's going to be sold all over the world, and uh, it, it's it's a showpiece. It's just like a showpiece car. Um, it can do things that other speakers cannot do. And um, it has 2,750 watts of internal power divided over four channels. 
Um, that's per speaker. That's per speaker, that's right, yeah. And it includes the Wavelet processor and the new technology that's involved with Stereo Unfold um, uh, that we in the process with Bomer Audio to build this speaker. And uh, uh, the other thing is that uh, the drivers that we use are as good as, as can be built by anyone. Um, these are all crafted. Uh, these mid woofers, for example, are the very latest neo woofers uh, available from uh, our source in Florence, Italy. And uh, uh, it's, it is a cost no object speaker. Um, it's not a million dollars, it's, and, uh, although there are some out there trying to charge that now, mm -hmm. but um, it's, it's all we know how to put into a speaker, let's put it that way. In other words, you put what was necessary to get the technological achievement you try to create. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah and try to keep the cost proportionate to what we put into it. So, Well, I was very impressed with this. In fact, um, I'm getting kind of tired of doing this video. I think I'm going to go back, sit on the couch, and listen to some music, and I'll report back to you guys later. And guys, if you like this video, please thumb it up. This is your opportunity to ask any questions you want or have about the speaker. I'm sure the folks at Legacy will be looking at this video after I publish it. So ask your questions. Maybe kind of nudge them to do a, a more cost-effective hint, hint, bookshelf model that people could actually pick up and move around the house if they want to. I'm very interested in something like that. So let us know what you're interested in. And if you're into this kind of technology, give us more comments. And guys, until next time, keep listening. All right. Live. We're going to be putting that as the outtakes, you know. <laughs>